To uh, give you an overview of uh, how the rest of the forum is organized, uh, I will begin with some brief framing comments, and then we're going to proceed to our three very distinguished uh, analysts, all joining us from, well, two from Manila and one from Kyoto, actually, uh, and close off with uh, our question and answer. Uh, before I get started, and again, in the interest of time, I want to uh, introduce at this point, very briefly, our speakers who will uh, each be giving us roughly 15 minutes of analysis. So we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Ronald Holmes, Professor of Political Science uh, at the uh, at De La Salle University and also President of Post Asia uh, Research. Uh, I also want to note that uh, Ronnie received his PhD from our department in 2019 after writing a splendid dissertation on the politics of the pork barrel in the Philippines, which of course has a very long history. He's also served as three terms, uh, uh, he served three terms as past president of the Philippine Political Science Association. Next, we have Mary Jess Nagilan Bituk uh, joining us from Rappler, the highly acclaimed news source that has been on the front line of the fight for press freedom in the Philippines. Uh, Mary Tess is a trailblazing investigative journalist, a former Neiman Fellow at Harvard, and author of many books, including Rock Solid, How the Philippines Won Its Maritime Case Against China. And thirdly, we have attorney Ona Caritos, uh, executive director of the Legal Network for Truthful uh, Elections, or Lente, a nationwide nonpartisan network of lawyers, law students, paralegals, and trained volunteers engaged in vote monitoring and legal work for honest elections in the Philippines. Attorney, attorney, attorney Caritos has her BA in political science and government from the Ateneo de Manila University and a Doctor of Law, Juris Doctoris, from the Ateneo in 2008. So as promised, I'm now going to be moving on to my framing comments, and these are provided particularly for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with how Philippine elections work, uh, and or for those who may not have followed some of the early developments leading up to the start of the 2022 campaign. So I'll just share screen. So this is the title of our um, overall forum today, Marcos Robredo, Assessing Dynamics of the May 2022 Presidential Election uh, in the Philippines. And um, excuse me, a little technical difficulty, it's not advancing. All right, if that is our only technical difficulty of the day, I think we're all very, very fortunate. So uh, yes, uh, just to, to give a bit of an overview on our framing comments, I'm, just, I'm going to be looking, first of all, at what's at stake in the May 2022 elections in the Philippines. Uh, then moving on to a brief look at the electoral rules of the game in the Philippines, some of the uh, distinguishing features of the uh, electoral system in the Philippines, and moving on to what can only be called the wild twists and turns of late 2021. And that is how President Duterte squandered his opportunity to play a decisive role in choosing uh, the next president. I guess this is probably a good point uh, to say as well, that all the views expressed in this forum are uh, uh, those of the participants and not those of the ANU or the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So, uh, uh, Ambassador Robinson has already gone through some of this. Um, we've got 67.5 million registered voters coming to the polls on the 9th of May, of whom 56% are between the ages of 18 and 41. That is very important because it highlights that many of those voters have no recollection whatsoever of the martial law years under Ferdinand Marcos uh, from 1972 to 1986. Uh, as uh, the ambassadors already said, we've got lots of different posts. I think we can say 
uh, that uh, a lot of this is a, a part of the heritage of American colonial rule in which the Americans were very good at holding elections, not so good at setting up uh, strong bureaucracy, but there's lots and lots of elections in the Philippines at all levels. Um, the, uh, from the Senate to uh, uh, more than 300 members of the House of Representatives to all these governors and, and um, uh, vice governors and mayors and uh, vice mayors, uh, councillors at the provincial level, and this is where the, real, the numbers really pop up, uh, roughly 13,500 city and town uh, councillors around, uh, around the country. So standing for our president, vice president, we have um, a number of uh, candidates. Uh, and uh, first of all, the, the one with the glitz in the upper left-hand corner, of course, is Bong Bong Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., uh, the uh, son of the conjugal dictatorship, and uh, Sarah Duterte, uh, the uh, daughter of the current president. Uh, then we have, uh, uh, moving to the right, Lenny Robredo, uh, who um, uh, it has uh, started to gain a little bit of momentum. We'll be looking at that today. Uh, and then I'm just going to look at the presidential candidates. Uh, onward to the right, uh, Esco Moreno, uh, mayor of Manila, and of course down on the lower left, we know Manny Pacquiao, uh, the uh, champion boxer turned senator, uh, Ping Lak Son, and uh, not getting much support in the polls, but distinguished by the fact that they're uh, two of the few candidates that actually have a platform, a serious platform, are Leody uh, de Guzman running for president and Walden Bellio running for vice president in the lower right hand corner. Uh, now, just to give some overview on how elections work in the Philippines, there's three features in particular that I want to highlight. First of all, the president and the vice president are elected separately. Uh, this is a rare system internationally, if I'm not mistaken, um, it's found in uh, Texas and maybe some other places. Um, uh, on the Texas point, uh, say no more. Uh, it's a very odd system. It opens up the possibility, frequently realized, that the top officials of two top officials of the land will come from different political parties. And since the 1987 constitution, there's only been one election, 2004, in which the president and vice president uh, win off one office uh, together. Second major feature is that victory comes from a mere plurality and it does not require a majority. And Exhibit A here is the 1992 election uh, with seven major candidates and the victor Fidel Ramos gaining only 23.6% of the total vote. Other candidates in that election included Imelda Marcos and the former Marcos Crony. So knowing that it's possible to win with such a small plurality encourages others to join in the fray as in the current election cycle. Of course, this is a system that is, can be contrasted with the two round system requiring an absolute majority as found in, for example, France and Indonesia. And we're seeing that now, of course, in the French election as it goes into the second round. Third major feature is that presidents are limited to a single term. This in discourages incumbents from investing in party uh, building and as our colleague Alan Hicken at the University of Michigan highlights, term limits, particularly those pertaining to the presidency, have contributed to less party discipline, more factionalism, and to a larger number of short-lived parties. But given the weakness of political parties, uh, what is important to highlight here is how families remain the most basic unit of political contention. Yesterday's allies may be today's rivals, uh, uh, yesterday's rivals may become today's allies. Key example here is former presidents uh, Estrada and Arroyo, who are now united, used to be on the, on the, um, uh, uh, used to be political foes. And I'm not saying that the possibilities of movement around are are endless, uh, but there can be some major reshuffling in what Benedict Anderson aptly called the kaleidosho kaleidoscope of oligarch power that we can find in the Philippines. Uh, and the election results are commonly assessed not based on the performance of parties, uh, but rather on that of families. Now, very briefly, a uh, last little bit of my framing comments, is to go back further than what I think we're going to find from the uh, analysis uh, today, but just to give background on how Duterte squandered his opportunity to play a decisive role. What's in it for Duterte, first of all, uh, as Nathan Kimpo explained uh, five years ago, he has to make sure that come June 2022, uh, that is two months hence from now, he's not going to be arrested or prosecuted for human rights violations. So he either needs to stay on, which he's chosen not to, 
or make sure that his successor is of the same mold and, and backing him. The most prominent threat is from the International Criminal Court, uh, but also potentially from a future administration that would not look kindly on his deeds of office. And the picture in the upper right hand corner is uh, Duterte with his fam famous list of narco politicians, which struck great fear in the hearts of politicians around the country. Uh, and uh, there is an unprecedented number of local politicians that have been killed during this uh, administration. And in the lower right, the very famous uh, photo from early in the so-called drug war in which a woman is pregnant the body of her dead partner on the streets of uh, Manila. Uh, so Duterte does not want to emulate two of his predecessors, either Joseph Estrada or Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, who were incarcerated on corruption charges after leaving the palace. It's apparent strategy. Um, who could be more reliable, reliably of the same mold uh, than his daughter? Uh, who succeeded him as mayor of Davao City, uh, Sarah Duterte Carpio, known in the election period, of course, as Duterte. Uh, and uh, another trusted person would have been his uh, former consigliere, now Senator Christopher Bongo. Now, this is a picture taken in Moscow about five years ago um, in happier times, uh, because there's certainly been plenty of contention uh, between uh, Mayor Duterte and uh, Senator Go since that time. Uh, now, all of that would have been the plan if he could have gotten one of them to stand for the presidency, but it was uh, an intrafamilial uh, uh, problem that came out. To put it more bluntly, this was really a bad time for a family spat that came out in October, August of 2021. And as so happened, as is so often the case with family disputes, there was a third party involved. Uh, Bong Bong Marco started courting. Sarah Duterte uh, uh, most uh, assiduously in October and then their so-called uh, marriage uh, in November. Now, here they are just standing at an election as sponsors, uh, but they sealed, sealed the deal at this wedding of the uh, 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 son or daughter of a Cavite politician. So President Duterte, uh, the papa, was not at all happy with this. And the days after Sarah had teamed up with Bong Bong, he launched a thinly veiled tirade against the man who was stealing his daughter away. Without naming names, he attacked someone fitting the description of Bong Bong for not only being a weak leader and a spoiled child only son, but also a cocaine addict. In a further lament that he expressed uh, rhetorically in, in an interview, uh, he said, why would you settle for vice president when you are ahead of the pack? And Sarah indeed had been ahead of Bong Bong Marcos in the uh, September elections. He also accused Marcos, as well as his arch, Marcos' arch rival, Vice President Lenny Robredo, of being pro-communist. So the result is that there has there the incumbent president has no anointed candidate. The Supremo isn't looking very supreme, but we should also point out that he re remains very popular. At this point, he has yet to endorse a presidential candidate, but he seems that he has probably adjusted to his daughter's dalliance with the Marcoses and his ruling party, for what it's worth, has come forth with uh, its uh, uh, endorsement of uh, both Marcos and, um, of course, Sarah Duterte. Uh, he likely, it's hard to know, sees the Marcoses as his salvation from prosecution and has come to accept his current uh, position. Uh, and just uh, to highlight, of course, Duterte got a great deal of support from the Marcoses in the 2016 campaign, uh, and he repaid that very importantly by allowing the former dictator to be interred at the Hero Cemetery. And uh, here we have a picture as well of the Marcos family. Uh, Imelda, of course, then Aimee Marcos, Senator Aimee Marcos, and then on the right, uh, Bong Bong Marcos uh, visiting the palace. So uh, from Duterte's standpoint, I think he can cope that a future president, Bong Bong, would have a stronger memory for all that he's, he did to rehabilitate the stature of the Marcos family uh, than for uh, Duterte's November 2021 accusations of weakness, fondness for co cocaine, and communist sympathies. So thanks, thanks very much. That's just my framing remarks to give some uh, background uh, before we proceed. Uh, and uh, now we want to move onward to uh, Ronnie Holmes.
Uh, thank you, Paul. And as expected, well, the framing of Paul actually just allows me to abbreviate a little bit the presentation today and have more time later on for the other presenters in our uh, open forum. I'd like to thank uh, PSC, Dr. Hatchcraft, and the organizers for this. It's an opportunity to be back in Canberra. I miss Canberra so much, but uh, I'm still in virtual space here and I cannot do mountain biking. We're at the home stretch. We're only about less than 20 days before elections. And uh, as it is, the record stands, at least based on our survey, that the son of the late dictator remains in the lead. There were other surveys that came out recently, and it shows still that the uh, Bombo Marcos is still ahead. But that's those are surveys that may probably change in the days to come. Elections in the Philippines may be as an additional framing to what Paul had given, really excites many Filipinos. And as the ambassador pointed out, you probably have more excitement and entertainment right now. Uh, last Sunday, Easter Sunday, we had a form of entertainment that happened in a, in a hotel that used to be just a venue for attempted coup d'etat. Uh, but then anyway, in this particular chart, you have 84% of the population saying that they're truly interested in the forthcoming election. We've been tracking this since September 2020. That's the first survey that we did after the pandemic, where 81% were saying they're interested. This 84% may be an indicator of the voting turnout that might be expected in May 9, 2022. In 2016, 82% turnout for the presidential election. In 2010, if I'm not mistaken, it was a little bit lower at 77%. Barring a surge in terms of COVID, we expect that given the intensity of the presidential race, you would have more or less this turnout of about 84%. As Paul noted, uh, if you look at the demographic of the voting population in the Philippines, about 42% of them, or even more, would have been born after the transition in 1986. Uh, and many of them are first-time voters. Uh, first-time voters would be people or voters who would be aged about 18, and the age range of 18 to 20. They're about 7% of the voting population. That doesn't rule out other 18 to 24 members of the 18 to 24 age groups who were disenfranchised in the last election and who might be voting for the first time. That youngest age group constitutes 17%. This is according to the COMELEC. The other age group that is young, born after 1986, constitute 25%. So altogether, the post-EDSA generation can be described as a huge generation, 42%. And some people are saying they may make a difference, either for or against whoever is leading or contending for the 2022 elections. Some portray the elections as a, as a referendum on the post-EDSA regime. Perhaps it is, but it may be more. Let's take note that the post-EDSA regime is actually a mix of administrations, some of whom are identified with the martial law regime. We've had only 12 years of the Aquinos, we had six years of Ramos, we had nine years of Aloyo, three years of Estrada, and six years of the third day where the country saw a significant democratic backsliding. We also have to take note that there are different generational aspirations among the baby boomers, my generation, the Gen Xers, and the Gen Z. And this might also explain why the expected youth vote is not coming along, or the youth vote in favor of the opposition is not something that is reflected in the surveys. One of the things I've been asked to do is to try to show some changes at the regional level this is a little bit small, but it's the only way I can do it in terms of comparing the results from our February survey with the March survey that we conducted. And these are at the regional level. I put some arrows. Uh, when the arrow is red, that means from the survey of February to March, that's a significant drop. When the arrow is green, that means that a significant increase in terms of voting preference. So here, we see a significant decline in the voting support for Bombo Marcos in Region 4A, which constitutes the largest, is the largest region, the region with the largest voting population. We also see a drop of 15 percentage points in Region 6 or Western Visayas. And quite surprisingly, a drop in the region where 
this learning may come from. This is region 11, Dabao, of 19 percentage points. On the other hand, the second learning uh, candidate, Vice President Lenny Robredo, increased in region 4A and increased in her own region, home region of region 5. Uh, take note that the March survey occurred soon after two big rallies of the Vice President. These were held first in Cavite, and the second one was in Panay, actually. There were two rallies there in Iloilo and in Negros Occidental. Now, whether this uh, increase in terms of her support in those two places will remain is something that would be seen in the last survey that we're doing this month that we hopefully would release by the end of the month. Uh, we also see a significant decline insofar as the support of the third contender, Isco Moreno, in Region 4A, which, is, which constitutes about 14% of the voting population. Um, another way to look at this regional uh, levels of support is to try to compare the level of support for the candidates, the main two candidates, this is BBM, or Bombo Marcos and Lenny Gerona Robredo, the vice president. These are the results of, these are the shares of the vice presidential election votes of the two candidates in 2016. What I did was to color code the regions where Bombo Marcos was ahead of Lenny and also where the Lenny Robredo was ahead of Bombo Marcos. You see that in 2016, Lenny Robredo was ahead of Bombo Marcos in most of the regions but there's been a shift in terms of support from the regions in the 2022 elections. Uh, and many people are asking, and they've asked me several times, what factors brought about this change in terms of voting support for the two contenders? What we need to understand would be that there have been many things that have happened since 2016. Uh, for one, the vice president has been the subject, the target of all disinformation and malinformation and that has already impact, had an impact, significant impact and detrimental at that on her approval and trust ratings. And even in terms of the level of support that she is receiving, at least in the pre-election surveys that we conducted from December of last year. Briefly, in the vice presidential race, we see uh, Sara Duterte maintaining majority support and taking more or less 13 of the 17 regions in this area. Uh, the two other contenders that are trying to catch up, Tito Soto and Kiko Pagalinan, are in a virtual tie. The separation between the two is just a single percentage point if we apply the margin of error. Kiko Pagalinan has also gained in the regions where Lenny has gained significantly. This is in region 4A and 5. But whether he has the momentum to be able to take the lead is, of course, another question. The last question I'd like to address would be, will voting disposition change significantly? Perhaps it would. Uh, we do have data from our exit poll that suggests that about almost, I mean, 40% uh, make their decision about a month or even on election day. Whether this will remain the same would, of course, be known uh, on May 9. Uh, but there are many things that we could not in any way capture in the survey. Uh, this would be the effect of the house-to-house -house votes, the effect of command votes, the extent by which any and all of the contenders can protect their votes, and a major, major blunder on the part of the front runner. Malami salamat po. I'll end here. Test, feel free to proceed. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, you need to stop sharing your screen. Yep, 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 yep. Wait, I'm looking for stop share. Okay. Okay, so it's my turn. Okay, um, sorry, just, okay. Take your time, it's fine. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I'll share my screen now. Okay, and then play from start. Okay, Perfect. can you Stop. can you see? It? Is it okay? Yep. Yep. Okay. Ah, uh, sorry. Oops. Okay. So good afternoon, good day to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Paul, for inviting me. And um, I, I've titled my presentation, Democracy on the Ballot, the Philippine Presidential Election. Um, now let me begin with the big picture, what at, what's at stake here in the presidential election. Uh, a lot, actually. And I'll start with, uh, and then the second agenda on my talk is, I see President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. as a continuity of Duterte's rule. And the third, uh, Paul asked me to give my reflections on social media. So I will explain a bit about how the Marcoses rebranded themselves using social media. And there are also other factors which allowed this. So, okay, let me begin by saying that I've been waiting for June 30, the, the day, the moment when Duterte will end his autocratic rule. Uh, so in anticipation of uh, bidding farewell to a president who, as Paul mentioned earlier, presided over a bloody war on drugs, elation should fill you know, many of our hearts here in the Philippines. But this is not happening because we're very anxious about this May election. As, as uh, Ronnie said, the front runner is the son of the late dictator. So while Duterte will fade out, his autocratic rule may live on because he has paved the way for a similar leader by undermining our democracy for almost six years. And then he allied himself with the Marcoses, even distorting history as, as Paul has shown by allowing the late dictators remains to be buried in the cemetery reserved for heroes. So it's been 36 years since the Marcoses were thrown out in a people power revolt. And they're back. They're coming back. And uh, that's why the stakes are so high in the May 9 election. And I, I'll go to further to say that the future of Philippine democracy is on the ballot. And I like this quote of the vice presidential candidate, Senator Francis Kiko Pangilinan. He said in a, in a forum, I think early this year, he's, he's running for vice president. He said, and I quote, the May 9 election is the final epic battle of our generation. Kiko is 58 years old, a student activist at the University of the Philippines in the 1980s. Since then, he has been standing up against the erosion of democracy, both on the streets and in the halls of the Senate. So he wouldn't have described our country's critical moment better. Um, after six years of Duterte, the prospect of a continuing decline of democracy looms. And of course, it has been said already that Duterte has, I mean, Bongbong has teamed up with, with Sara. And, and um, for me and for some of us here, this is what they represent. We represent the dark side of the unsavory side of Philippine politics, the perpetuation of dynasties, democratic decline, and a huge sense of entitlement. As we know, the Marcoses had a grip on power for decades, interrupted only in 1986, and then their subsequent exile. But as you know, they've since returned to local and national politics, and I'll talk about how they rebranded themselves later. As for the Dutertes, they have controlled Davao for almost 30 years, from Rodrigo to his children, Sara, mayor for two terms, Sebastian, currently vice mayor and running for mayor, and Paulo, former vice mayor who is running for re-election as congressman. Since both of these candidates belong to political families, they have this enormous sense of entitlement that public office is a family enterprise, and as Paul said families are quite strong here uh, rather than political parties. And they capitalize on their names because name recall works well in the Philippines. 
Uh, as we know, Marcos Jr. was convicted for non-payment of income taxes and also as co-executor of his late father's estate. He has not paid ex estate taxes, which was computed as of 1997 at 23 billion pesos, but which may have ballooned already to 2022 to 203 billion pesos. So if he wins, what will happen to those taxes? So transparency and accountability are also on the line here. And we will, as I will show later, they are not strong suits, suits of both Bongbong and Sara. Bongbong has already said openly that he will shield President with, in so many words, that he will shield President Duterte from the International Criminal Court probe on the drug war. And the same thing is expected from Sara. Well, Bongbong does not really say that he is the continuity candidate, uh, but by pairing up with Sara, that gives the message that he will be continuing President Duterte's programs. And the legacy of Duterte is not when it comes to uh, uh, in building up of democratic institutions, uh, is of course very, very uh, disturbing. He has really weakened accountability, rule of law, and also has squeezed the independent media. So this opacity, this opacity under uh, the Duterte administration um, has made it easy for Bongbong to, to take similar positions as Duterte. Uh, Bongbong has said he will not release his asset statement and Duterte hasn't released. He's the first president uh, in decades not to release his asset statement. So it's easy for Bongbong to take that same position, but when he said this in public, he was criticized and he changed his mind. He said, okay, when he, uh, he will release his asset statement, but what if he wins? He might change his mind again. And among the candidates, he's the least open. Uh, that's why we foresee when he, if he wins, that there will, just like Duterte, Malacanang will not be transparent. Uh, they will continue the secrecy. On the campaign trail, reporters have been uh, complaining about how difficult it is just to get inter an, just even an ambush interview with him. And a most recent example was our own reporter who was blocked by his aides and guards when she was trying to uh, just run after him for, for a question. So, and also, as we know, he has snubbed a number of debates and uh, he only gives interviews to select um, media and Partisan, partisan bloggers, and again, uh, he was asked, Bongbong Marcos was asked, how will he be different from Duterte? He said that he and Duterte's personalities are different, but he did not elaborate. So now the other question is, the question is, will the new president, if it's Bongbong, will he abide by the democrat playbook? And then, let me now go to foreign policy. Oh, I, this was, well, he, sell, he doesn't really, as I said earlier, sell himself as a continuity candidate, but I've discussed his the weak transparency and poor accountability. Now let me go to the foreign policy question and I'll focus on China because we have a lingering maritime dispute. So the question now is, will the next leader continue to embrace China at the expense of the US and other allies. So this election is crucial also for foreign policy as because of the shock waves that have been brought about by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how the next leader views democracy and a world order that may be reshaped in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is, is quite important. So Marcos, the front runner, has said that he's inclined to set aside the arbitral tribunal ruling when the Philippines won against China in 2016, and he favors bilateral talks with China, which is also China's preferred mode of negotiations to talk about our dispute over parts of South China Sea. And he also said that he will seek an agreement with China to allow Filipinos to fish in the West Philippine Sea, relying on personal ties with Chinese officials rather than on the rule of law. So he already said that he has friends in the Chinese embassy, and he said that they have been talking about it as if it were 
an issue that could be settled by just talking about it between the Chinese ambassador and Bong Bong Mark. And he also said, but he doesn't seem to be aware that the constitution allows Filipinos to fish in the West Philippine Sea, which is part of our country's exclusive economic zone. So I'll show in the next slide the positions of the leading candidates when it comes to our maritime dispute with China. Robredo has been more categorical in saying that the victory of the Philippines must be leveraged and that the Philippines should enter into alliances with traditional and emerging partners so that they can help protect the West Philippine Sea. And many countries have sided with the Philippines since 2016, including US, Japan, Australia, Canada, and the European Union. And of course, Robredo has said that she will, the country will collaborate with China in areas that have no conflict, such as trade and investment, similar to what Vietnam has been doing. But when it comes to the West Philippine Sea, Robredo said, um, we cannot deal with them without the recognition of the arbitral ruling. Now let's talk about the rebranding of the Marcoses. Why has this happened? Because there are no standard history textbooks uh, in the Philippines. And of course, these three factors do not answer completely the question of how the Marcoses have rebranded themselves. But high school and college textbooks do not thoroughly discuss the Marcos years. These have been already researched. These have been already noted, but especially by one academic, Antonio Go, who has been documenting errors in our textbooks. For example, out of the 18 pages on martial law, the bulk of it is on the positive effects of the dictatorship, while only two and a half pages dealt with the negative consequences of martial law. So unlike Germany, we don't have standard history textbooks that chronicle the rise, let's say, of Hitler to power in 1993 up to the Holocaust. And so the, our past governments neglected, actually, to shape, neglected to shape the curriculum of our schools. The second reason, of course, is the social, use of social media for this information. They've cleverly used YouTube, TikTok, Facebook to tell uh, lies and say that the Marcos years were the golden age uh, in uh, Philippine politics and governance. This has been documented already, the videos. In April 2021, Rappler already reported that lies about the wealth of the late dictator continue to spread on YouTube without labels or warnings, even if this were already fact-checked by historians and denounced as lies. And a recent study, a more recent study, showed that this was done by UP, a College of Mass, Institute of Mass Communication. From October, from the filing of certificates of candidacy in October 2021 up to February this year, this information has targeted mainly Robredo and Ferdinand Marcos Jr. But the big difference is Robredo was the subject of negative messaging while Marcos was the subject of positive branding. So the big difference, in fact, Robredo has been called rather harshly, Madame, M-A-D-U-M-B, lightheaded, stupid, stammerer. But in the case of Marcos Jr., this information included false endorsements from celebrities and even heads of state, like the New Zealand prime minister, who was said to have endorsed him, but of course this was not true. The biggest enabler of this information of all networking, social networking sites is YouTube, and I'm sorry, Facebook, followed by YouTube and TikTok. A similar study on YouTube found 600 videos that promoted the narrative that the Philippines was a great nation during the regime of Ferdinand Marx. So we can see that uh, aside from this, there's a third factor and so many other factors, but Manolo Quezon, the a historian and writer who has followed the Marcoses closely, said that millennials have told him that the Marcoses have crossed over from the political to the cultural sphere, that their Imelda especially is seen as a celebrity rather than a politician, which is a dangerous 
way of seeing these politicians because it puts them in a different, a more positive light. I'd like to add one more factor though. What enabled this disinformation to thrive? It's because also of our slow and flawed judicial system. Supporters of Marcos say they have, no one has ever been sent to jail. Imelda was convicted of graft, but she's still around. Bongbong did not pay his taxes, yet it's okay. He's being, he was allowed to run for president, etc., etc. So this kind of, this is part of the context uh, wherein the Marcoses were allowed uh, to thrive and rehabilitate themselves. But of course, we have, we have uh, fact-checking groups. It's very, they're doing good work. There are uh, groups of academics, um, civil society groups, and media that have gotten together. Hashtag facts first PH and hashtag sec PSEAK dot PH. So at least on that positive note, I will end my talk and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Martes. And now we'll move to Attorney Coricos on the Thank you, thank you for. Thank you, all, thank you to all our friends from ANU. Thank you to Ambassador Robinson, to all my co-panelists this afternoon. Uh, I'll be presenting on uh, several uh, topics. So let me just share my screen now. Okay, again, maraming salamat and maganda hapon. Thank you very much and good afternoon to all of us. So, I'll be discussing per first the current state of affairs in the elections in the Philippines. Just like what uh, Ronnie mentioned earlier, uh, we have 18 days to go before election day. This is the home stretch, last two minutes if you will uh, compare it to a basketball game. Overseas voting is ongoing and Ambassador Robinson mentioned it earlier that we have 1.7 million overseas voters all over the world and it started April 10 and based from the observations for the past few weeks there's a uh, heightened vigilance from the two contending parties uh, we've seen uh, reports allegations on pre-shaded ballots being given to overseas voters uh, delay in the delivery of the different election paraphernalia and ballots but what's good uh, what's good now is that Compared to previous elections, the action or the reply of our Commission on Elections, our election management body, is they reply right away, they address the problem head on. If you would compare their uh, uh, their response in previous elections, it would take them a number of days for them to react or for them to respond to allegations of, for example, a cliched ballot. But now, we've seen the Commission on Elections, our election management body, and the different embassies and consulates respond right away to the problem. For example, uh, the pre-shaded ballot given to a voter, one of the voters in the in Singapore, and the embassy came up with a statement the day after the report or the allegation or the post went viral in the different online platforms. So that's what's going for us. Uh, Comelec, our election management body, is quick to respond right away to different allegations which would affect the integrity and the credibility of the election of the elections. Election paraphernalia and machines have been started to deploy a few weeks ago and just the other day, uh, ballots were already started to deploy as, as well. And there's uh, an ongoing investigation right now actually in our Congress about an incident involving a Smartmatic employee and it's already clarified that this incident doesn't affect the 2022 national and local elections, but ongoing investigations are being conducted right now by Senator Aini Marcos, the chairperson of the suffrage committee at the House, who is the Senate, who is the sister as well of the uh, number one candidate for the presidential position. And uh, her counterpart committee at the House of Representatives is also chaired by one of their colleagues or one of their longtime uh, partners in the in uh, Philippine politics rep representative there, but all of these investigations it does it would not affect and it would not change the system that we will have this upcoming May 9 elections. 
what I'm seeing is that this investigation is just laying the predicate to an, an eventual adoption or going back of to, an hybrid, to a hybrid election system in the Philippines. For the past 12 years, the Philippines has adopted an automated election system, manual vote, manual vote uh, electronic count, electronic manual vote, electronic count, electronic uh, transmission, and electronic canvassing. So what uh, Mark, what what Senator Marcos has been doing for the past three years is pushing uh, for this uh, adoption of the hybrid election system, but she was not that, that successful in this Congress. So I'm anticipating, uh, a lot of us are anticipating in the civil society world that after the elections uh, this year, after the May elections, uh, they have laid the predicate that the, there is a need to replace uh, the Smartmatic or the automated election system to make the elections more credible. But if you would take a look actually at the different surveys conducted, for example, by Pulse Asia and SWS after each election, uh, and uh, the survey is about the uh, the trust uh, by the Filipinos on the automated election system, and more than 80% of Filipinos actually trust the system being used in the elections, but it's contrary to what our politicians have been pushing for the past few years. That they're seeing and they're presenting to the general public that the automated election system can't be trusted. Uh, international observers are already here. Carter Center is already here. Uh, ANFEL has started to deploy its observers all over the country. ANFEL is Asian network for free elections. And we have an all Duterte appointee in our commission on elections. So all the commissioners and the chairpersons are already appointed by the president. We have one commissioner, Commissioner Ferlino, handling a number of committees in the Commission on Elections. For example, the random manual audit, the packing, logistics for the different election paraphernalia and ballots. The VSO, or the Vulnerable Sector Office, it's an office in charge exclusively to address the concerns, the problems of uh, vulnerable sectors in uh, Philippine elections. She's also in charge, actually, of the gun bond. She was given the head, the leadership of this committee uh, a few days ago. We have one commissioner who's a spokesperson uh, of the family together with Director James Jimenez. And this commissioner, uh, Commissioner Garcia, is uh, before his appointment in the Commission on Elections, he was a long-time long election lawyer to a number of national candidates like Senator Marcos, uh, but, uh, Mayor uh, Isco Moreno. So we have one uh, lo election lawyer in the commission right now. Uh, we have three non-eligible non commissioners in the commission on elections. We have Commissioner Casquejo. Uh, he rose from the ranks. He was one of the Davao appointees of the president. Commissioner Ferrellino is also a Comelec employee who rose from the ranks as well. And we have uh, Commissioner Garcia, a long-time election lawyer. We have one fo commissioner focused on adjudication, Commissioner Bulay, and his background is he was the former uh, prosecutor or fiscal of the city of Manila. And based from our conversation with him the other day, he did not want to take on, in any, on, on any of the committees. He just wanted to just resolve cases of the commission. We have one also new commissioner with actually no knowledge or background about Philippine elections, but he was appointed as well. And he heads now the new normal committee, which uh, addresses the effect of the pandemic in Philippine elections. So that's Commissioner Neri. And the chairperson of the Commission on Elections is a former politician, a chairperson Pangarungan. And he's a politician uh, based in Lano del Sur, one of the problematic uh, Barm or Bangsamoro Autonomous Region Muslim Mindanao provinces uh, down south of the country. But if you would ask me how, how are things going and how are the preparation of Pomelec, it's all systems go actually. All the resolutions uh, for the conduct of election day is already, uh, uh, it was already issued out almost uh, four months ago. Late last year, all the electoral board members or our poll workers are already uh, trained. Um, and uh, almost all the election paraphernalia ballots are already deployed. So we're just waiting actually for the day of the election. And we have 18 days to go. As to the impact of COVID, 
uh, when it comes to transparency, there was an issue at the start of this year that uh, when the ballots were being printed, and it's under our law that when ballots are being printed, it has to be observed by watchers or monitors coming from uh, the political parties, accredited citizens arm, or our election monitoring booths. But at the start of this year, if you're not familiar, the country suffered its first surge for this year. So the reasoning or the reason of Commissioner Casquejo, the chairperson or the commissioner in charge for the overall conduct of the 2022 national and local elections, they did not invite observers and they did, they did not open the painting of ballots observers because of the surge last January or the start of this year. So for 70% of the painting duration of the ballots, there were no observers present. And when uh, one of the lawyers of Vice President Shabodobedo complained of this lack of transparency that <clears throat> that was the only time that they opened the ballot printing to observers and they live streamed as well the printing of the ballots. COVID, COVID also affected the ongoing campaign. Kamala created a new committee to basically issue out some campaign permits whenever political parties and candidates are... <laughs> are undergoing in-person activities like rallies, caravans, flying or house to house. But for a time, this committee was under hot water because they a lot of people were complaining that it was a redundancy on the part of the Commission on Elections to also issue out a permit to campaign because the LGU or our local government units are already doing this part during the campaign period. So Comalek adjusted the rules when things improve after the January stage. So if it's alert level 1 and 2 in the Philippines or in areas all over the country, <laughs> uh, candidates and political parties no, no longer need to apply for permits before this Comalek campaign committee. As to the impact of COVID on election day conduct, face mask usage is mandatory, so you will not be allowed to vote or you will not be allowed entry in the voting centers if you will not be wearing a face mask on election day. The number of watchers is also limited. Uh, right now, uh, the identification of watchers inside the polling places, it's limited to the dominant majority white watcher, to the dominant minority watcher, and accredited uh, the watcher from the accredited citizens arm. But there is a flexibility provision on this common like resolution on election day conduct that if fifth if the situation would get critical or if uh, if uh, a surge will happen in time for the election, Comelec would issue out another resolution adapting uh, its rules or guidelines on election day conduct to address if ever the surge uh, with, uh, that would happen, hopefully not happen on election day. To address the COVID and to address uh, overcrowding on election day, the voting hours are extended. It's from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And there's an additional staff, support staff, to hired by Comelec right now to ensure compliance with minimum health and safety protocols in all the voting centers to be used on election day. So uh, as to Comelec efforts to regulate social media, for everyone's information, we have an obsolete legal framework. The legal framework right now that we have, it was passed and it was uh, it was issued 2001. So when this framework was issued out, the use of the internet uh, for campaigning, it was not uh, it was not in the context when the law was passed. So we have an obsolete UK framework. What's, what Comelec is doing right now is to use campaign finance law, campaign, campaign finance laws to somehow regulate the use of social media and campaigning. And they did this in the last 2019 midterm elections, wherein they required political parties and candidates to report their official online accounts. So they repeated this provision for this election as well. Comelec also has an ongoing partnership with the different online platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And for the first time uh, in, 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 in Philippine elections, Comelec created a task force to go after peddlers of misinformation and disinformation. But they will not go after disinformation against candidates, but they will just go after peddlers of misinformation, disinformation, again, against the electoral process or against the commission on elections. Basically, uh, information which would affect the credibility of the elections or the conduct of the elections. 
Other issues, the unusual degree of public contention within COMELEC. So early this year, we had this feud between Commissioner Guanson and Commissioner Ferrolino, and that was to resolve when the decision of against the leading candidate for the presidential election was not resolved, uh, even though Commissioner Guanson already retired end of January. Uh, there was a feud a few days ago between Commissioner Inti and uh, Chairperson Pangarunan. Commissioner Inting before was the head or the committee head for the uh, gun ban and issuance of firearms authority. But because there was a bit of delay in the issuance of permits for gun ban and the use of uh, security forces during the campaign period, uh, extra extraordinary authority was given to Chairperson Pangadungan in the sense that Chairperson Pangadungan now can issue out on his own certificates of authority to individuals and groups which he would feel need the certificates of authority right away. So Commissioner Inting was slighted with this extraordinary authority given to Chairperson Parangarungan. So she resigned uh, a few weeks ago from the post and she was replaced by Commissioner Perolino. Uh, there's another issue about the logistics contract of uh, Dennis Uy, F2 Logistics. But for everyone's information, F2 Logistics also won this contract in the 2019 midterm elections, but it was with other vendors. This time around, for the elections, uh, F2 Logistics won all the lot for the transportation of the different election paraphernalia and ballots. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, talk right now about this contract, but uh, groups are wary and they're being vigilant in the transportation of all the ballots and logistics. Another issue is just recently, uh, President Duterte vetoed uh, a bill on SIM card registration, which included the provision on the use of real names uh, in the different online uh, social media platforms. This provision uh, was inserted by Senator Gilon for the for the sole reason that it's needed to combat or to battle trolls. Uh, which spread misinformation and disinformation. But this bill was vetoed by President Duterte a few days ago. So together, and his sole reason to veto the bill was this provision for real name use on a different online social media platforms. So he did not disagree with SIM card registration, with the mandatory SIM card registration, but he disagreed with the provision for real name use on the different online social media platforms. So. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ona. And um, thanks as well to Ronnie and Martes. Uh, we are right on time. We wanted to have about 25 minutes of, uh, for Q&A, and that's exactly what we have uh, left here. So, I want to begin by uh, uh, first asking those who are uh, physically in the room here whether uh, you have uh, any questions. And also for those of you who are joining us uh, online, uh, please post your questions in the uh, chat box. And I'm um, uh, very appreciative of getting the assistance of my colleague, Dr. Maria Tanya, in monitoring that uh, chat box. And um, she'll be feeding those questions to me. Uh, and I think also, uh, just to be sure, I will be repeating uh, whatever questions uh, come from the floor here. So all the more, uh, from a personal interest, I would ask that the questions be uh, succinct and, and to the point uh, to make sure that uh, everything is, is heard uh, by those who are joining us online. So uh, starting then uh, with the uh, uh, people in, in the room here, and uh, great to have you here in person, uh, who would like to ask the first question? Professor Hal Hill. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm Hal Hill from ANU. Uh, and thanks to all the speakers. I really enjoyed the presentations. Someone mentioned continuity across administrations. I think it might have been St Ambassador Steve. It seems to me that's quite an important point, isn't it? Uh, including, especially on economic management. The Philippine economy pre COVID was doing pretty well by regional standards. And I think that owes a lot to competent techni technical appointments in the key departments, finance, budget management, uh, NADA, and also the BSD Central Bank. So I'm wondering whether we can get a sense of whether that's likely to be a continuing feature of 
the Philippines. Uh, it's been a feature more or less in the democratic era with exceptions, but I'd like to know whether that's um, uh, whether that's likely to be a, a, a continuing feature. Can I ask can I have a PS or maybe not? Maybe later. Yes, yeah, yes, you can, and uh, particularly because I'm told there's no need to repeat because your your voice is coming through clearly. So, okay. Uh, so PS, if I can just ask this, it's perhaps a bit provocative. Uh, if if Bong Bong is the likely winner, what are going to be the defining characteristics? Uh, is it going to be lazy, uh, payback, time, um, uh, corrupt, uh, or reformers trying to rehabilitate the name of Marcos meaningfully? Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Hal. So we have two questions from uh, Hal Hill, and those will be posed to any of our three uh, speakers. Uh, Ronnie. Uh, Maritess, our owner, who would like to uh, take on one or both of these questions from Hal? Or, or you both. <laughs> <laughs> Very provocative questions from Hal. Hi, Hal. Hi. Um, it, it's, hard, it's hard to say whether Bombo Marcos will depart from any of the economic policies of the current administration. I think it would be difficult to do that. But I think one of the worries right now would be how we would manage the public finances, specifically given that the country's debt has increased during the pandemic. And the record of his father is something that is really causing that apprehension insofar as debt management. Uh, I remember that each of the candidates had been asked, who are you going to bring in? for your public finance and economies. I think most of the economists pledged their support for Vice President Lenny Robredo, Hal, the ones that you know. Uh, largely, I think everyone in the UP School of Economics are in that roster of econ economists for Lenny. So that's one thing. We don't know who's going to be the economic manager in any of the camps. Uh, none of them have identified. Um, and it, it, I think, to a certain extent, they would be a little bit more prudent now because unlike the past, there's much more information that's available to the public. And there should be a pushback if and when there would be, again, a repeat of the kleptocracy that we've seen in the Marcos regime. Thank you, well, can I, Ronnie. Can I, uh, can, I, can I say something? Right. Can I add something? Please. Yeah. Uh, among the presidential candidates, at least between Robredo and Marcos, Robre Marcos has been the least uh, open. He has no written platform. There, if you go to his website, there is no written economic pl platform or social development platform, where all the rest of the candidates have. And so you have to Google every time you want to know where he stands on an issue. And so, and, and, and he, it's really very difficult to get his positions, except uh, maybe in some instances, like he said, he will help the small and medium scale enterprises. So uh, Ronnie's right, it will be very difficult to depart from the current economic policies, but there is a worry among the in the business community. And in fact, there was a Bloomberg poll, which showed that they, they have a high trust for Robredo, not for Marcos. There are pending cases in the Supreme Court uh, wherein the Marcoses uh, want to get, like, for example, 60% of Lucio Tan's companies that's pending in the Supreme Court and the estate taxes as well. So uh, there is that fear and apprehension in the business community and, and even among ordinary citizens about uh, what will Marco, Bong Bong Marcos be? That's the big question, actually. How will he be as a president? Who will he uh, depend on to run the economic affairs and since he's known not to work very hard uh, I mean he's not very disciplined but his wife Lisa Araneta Marcos is a lawyer from Ateneo and she worked in a New York uh, law firm and is said to be the one running the campaign so the talk here is that uh, she will she may run the office of the president Uh, Ola, would you have anything to add? Okay. Uh, I, Hal, you asked me to give a, a few thoughts, and I, I, I think that uh, one of the uh, mysteries behind 
uh, Marcos, is we just don't know who would be appointed to some of the key posts, uh, whether it be uh, Secretary of Finance or NEDA um, or in other spheres, uh, who might be appointed uh, Secretary of Defense, who might be appointed Secretary of, of Foreign Affairs. There just uh, hasn't been much attention to issues in this campaign. Uh, and if you really want to get a flavor for it, get on to YouTube and look at these chatty things between uh, 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 Bongo bon Marcos and his son, uh, Sandro. I mean, they're, they're completely vapid discussions that the two of them are having. Uh, but as uh, Washington Post reporter uh, recently um, uh, said in a, in a really good piece on social media in the campaign, uh, she first quoted Alfred W. McCoy, um, who has uh, chronicled the ravages of the Marcos regime, of course. And then she goes on to say, but who's really going to be listening to experts? I mean, how can experts compete with one posting in TikTok that gets 50,000 uh, hits uh, uh, right away and uh, is uh, all about uh, resurrecting the Marcos family name? So um, it's, it's one issue to, uh, uh, important issue to try to to discern uh, all of this, but it's really like reading tea leaves. It's very difficult to know where uh, a Marcos administration might go, where it's much easier to predict the general sorts of directions that uh, would come from a uh, Robredo uh, presidency. So, uh, and also in terms of continuity, this gets into your second question as well. Uh, is, it, is it continuity in terms of some economic reforms, uh, or is it continuity in terms of going back to the cronyism of the Marcos years. I mean, uh, we don't even know whether uh, Bong Bong has the diligence to really want to be a um, and, and uh, what his what his goals might be, or whether he would just sit on the the laurels of the family fortune that's already there for him to, to enjoy. Uh, so that's, that's another thing. It's, it's just looking at uh, the, the degree to which there might be uh, continuity back across the uh, uh, decades as well. Yes. Other, are there questions uh, from the chat room here? Mm -hmm. Take this one here, great. Um, so uh, this is a, a question from one of our online participants. Uh, what do you think is the priority issue for Filipinos in the upcoming generation? generation, particularly for uh, Gen Z in the Philippines, Gen Z in Australia, and millennial uh, voters. Um, so any, any thoughts that you might have on, on priority issues? Uh, Ronnie, Martes, or Ona? Ronnie, Pulse Asia has the answers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pulse Asia has the answers. After coming from two classes, this is what I get. Anyway, um, we don't see that much of a difference in terms of generational concerns, uh, at least in the survey. Um, in, other, in other studies that have been done, which are qualitative, there are some um, manifest concerns on the part of the younger generation. This, happened, this would have to do with education in the extent by which the pandemic has affected their own learning. So these are the Gen Z, these are the people who are still in the universities. But whether this has an impact in terms of their voting behavior, we're not seeing any youth vote. We're not seeing any women's vote. We're not seeing any electorate in the surveys. And I think Paul and many who studied Philippine politics would understand that perhaps the only thing that explains voting patterns in the past and even now would be ethno-linguistic ties. So, there's no differentiation in terms of the issue that they want. The primary issue now is really the high prices of commodities. And it cuts across socioeconomic classes and generations. Marcus, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, because Pulse does comprehensive surveys, so that's quite representative of the issue. I, I would like to push uh, you just a little bit, uh, Ronnie, on the lack of a youth vote, um, because uh, from, from what I understand, uh, the social media effort has been most effective in terms of uh, resonating with the social uh, media message of the uh, Marcus administration has uh, resonated most effectively 
uh, with youth. And there is a generational uh, trend that you can see. The older people get, the less uh, they tend to be affected by social media. Um, I didn't see that in, social, in uh, Pulse Asia, so I'm not sure whether your own results uh, conform with that, but it, it did come out in a, uh, a column of Manolo Case on the other day. Um, yeah, probably my understanding is correct. I'm, I'm referring more to a youth oppositional vote. <laughs> right, uh, but how about a youth vote for Marcos? It's a youth vote for Marcos, yes. 77% of the 18-year-olds registered support for Marcos in the March 2022 survey against 45% among those 65 and above. So that means that the generation who lived through martial law, who experienced martial law, are less supportive of Marcos, although of course, they still express support for him. But the 18-year-olds fall 77%. So that's the youth vote. It's a youth vote for Bombo Marcos. And as you said, the extent by which they're exposed to social media, their access to the internet is universal. And one of the things we see in the survey is that, you know, two out of three who have access to the internet are getting their news from the internet. And in that case, if you have a large segment of the youth population accessing the internet, then that's two out of three probably getting this information from micro bloggers and micro influencers. Great, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you for uh, elucidating that point. Uh, now it's a uh, turn to, uh, for people in the room here to ask any questions. Uh, please, uh, Lena Tama from International Idea. Yeah. Uh, what if uh, Lenny wins the presidency and Sarah Bebe becomes the vice president? What, uh, what will happen? Okay, so what will be the dynamics uh, between the two? Okay, so uh, Lena is asking our panelists, uh, what might be the dynamics uh, if uh, Lenny Robredo wins the presidency and Sarah Duterte wins the vice presidency? Uh, any of you want to take that question on? <laughs> well, uh, well, yeah, I, I haven't really thought much about it, but um, I don't know if Lenny will do what Duterte did to her, not give her any cabinet post, uh, or at least she gave her a role in the anti-drug war, but only for 18 days. So will Lenny do to Sarah what Rodrigo did to her? That's the question. So she has, that has to, it's not clear yet to me if she will do that, because it's quite, um, the next six years, if Sarah wins for VP, and that will be her stepping stone or platform to run for the presidency I mean, six years later. That will be uh, Duterte part two. So, but Ronnie, what do you think? I think it's 1986, Doyle Laurel and Cory Aquino, potentially. Uh, less of what Lenny would do, more in terms of what Sarah would be doing. If Lenny wins the presidency, will she extend her hand to Sara Duterte? I think that's most likely. Will Sara Duterte collaborate? She probably would, but she might also do the same thing that Doyle Laurel, the vice president under Cole Aquino did, which was to first question some policies and eventually distance himself from the administration. So that's also a possibility. Paul, I just want to add to that. To the answer. Uh, there, are, yeah. there are a number of groups actually right now posting for this partnership between Robredo and Sara. The group is called Rosa. Uh, and uh, if ever uh, she will win the presidency together with Sara, in the Philippines after each election, whoever is the president, uh, there is talk that, uh, for, uh, for example, if Lenny wins, that she will have a problem controlling the legislature because most of the uh, representatives, uh, elected representatives and senators will be coming from the camp of President Duterte and the other uh, the other groups aside from her opposition slate. But as we know, in Philippine elections, whoever wins the presidency, all of uh, the elected uh, politicians would transfer to that party, to the party of the winning president. So I think that's the dynamics that we're looking at after this election, if ever the partnership of Robredo and Sarah will win the May elections. 
Great, thank you, Ona, for highlighting that important historical pattern. Um, the next question I would like to take uh, comes from uh, online, uh, and that is um, addressed to anyone. Uh, what is the likelihood at this stage of a miracle outcome for Lenny Robredo? Uh, how strong is the momentum for her? Uh, so uh, uh, we'll turn to any of our uh, panelists on that one. Uh, uh, Ronnie, Martes, Ona? Ronnie, Ronnie first because he has the data. <laughs> uh, can I just dance like in TikTok? Uh, anyway, the likelihood of a miracle, of course it's a miracle, so it's likely it may happen, it may not happen. But I think one thing that we have to be very objective about is the distance between Marcos and Robredo. It's 32 percentage points. That means it would require a drop of at least 16 percentage points on the part of Marcos and an increase of 16 percentage points support on the part of Tobedo to get them into a tie. Um, now, is that possible? Yes, it is uh, because we've seen it happen in the past where you've had a drop, a significant drop in so far as the front runner, but not to extent of 16 points. No? Um, what we've seen is that the campaign of Robredo has escalated in terms of their direct voter contact, the house to house. In, uh, and I'm speaking more as a political scientist, the literature I reviewed point out that direct voter contact has much more of an effect on voting decision. The question, however, is that do these people who do house to house have the time to change the minds of people who are voting for Bong Bong Marcos? Um, and well, let's hope that they do. Um, we only have 18, 16 days remaining for campaign, 18 days before the election. So the chances are there, but it's really quite limited. Second point I'd like to raise would be the command votes. And the command votes here are not just command votes to deliver votes for, let's say, Bombo Marcos. It would be command votes or command that may actually prevent turnout of people in areas that might be supportive of Lenny Robredo. Uh, so it's the opposite of turnout buying. It's basically preventing people from turning out. And that's one other thing. The third one would be in terms of cheating and all sorts of vote buying that will happen. Are they capable of protecting their votes? Even if there's a swing in terms of support, can the Lenny Robredo camp effectively protect their votes, which is really a problem in a country such as the Philippines historically that's one of the costliest part of an election campaign uh, ronnie maybe uh or Anna rather Anna, would you be able to add on the role of the ppcrv will they be able to protect votes i mean they are the accredited volunteer arm their, their plan is to deploy deploy 500,000 volunteers all over the there's 7,000 plus voting centers but primarily I, I think they see their role as collectors of the election return or the ERs to be printed out by the vote counting machines in all the polling places in all the voting centers but because of their presence they will be able to um, hopefully they will be able to monitor uh, voter fraud if ever it happens but I'm really concerned, for example, about the controlled areas, for example, in Barn or the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao. If you take a look at Philippine elections, historically, whoever delivers or whoever wins the Barn votes uh, wins the election. So hopefully, uh, the BTA right now would not play politics or they would just let the people vote in the Barn. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. That's my opinion. Uh, we're partnering with BFEM, that's the accredited citizens arm in the Bangsamoro, the Bangsamoro uh, free election monitors in the Bangsamoro. Historically, PPCRV is not present in the arm region or the Bangsamoro region. So there is an accredited citizens arm in the, the Bangsamoro region as well. Yeah, uh, Paul, can I just add, just, this is not yes, about, please. yeah, this is not about a miracle, but this is just to point out that the new things that we've been observing in the campaign of Lenny Robredo, because her campaign has gained momentum. And some uh, people are 
In fact, Lenny herself in an interview said that the fervor, the intensity, she has never felt this in all her campaigns or other campaigns. And she even compared it to the fervor of EDSA, although the context then was different no, in 1986. And the volunteer-driven mm -hmm. campaign is fascinating. Um, I don't know. I've never seen anything like it since... I don't know if in 86, if people were spending their own money, you know, doing, uh, was there a burst of creativity? Of course, again, it was a different context. But now, uh, there's a lot of uh, volunteerism, which we also see as like the continuity of the community pantry in uh, last year, where you saw the rise of generosity of people and, and kindness, and which uh, was able to transform the community pantry into a movement at least for a year. So anyway, it's just uh, one fascinating new thing with the campaign of Lenny Robredo today. Thank you, yeah, Martes. And something that's much commented upon um, when um, uh, people are, are looking at the possibility of uh, that, that momentum coming through. Um, now, just to be, um, a seat from the floor first. Yeah, we're, we're going to alternate back and forth between the floor and uh, online. Uh, so, are there any uh, questions here from uh, from from the room? Uh, there's uh, two two questions. We might as well take them both uh, in in uh, uh, succession. Uh, so, uh, uh, first of all, Bill. So, please, I'm uh, Bill Dinneman. Um, I've got a background going back to 1960 with the company, so I've watched it very closely. Uh, professionally and uh, personally uh, for that long. And um, we all remember, I think, the impact that the involvement of Archbishop um, the Cardinal Sin mm -hmm. had on the inside uh, resolution. And I'm wondering, I've noticed in, uh, over the last few weeks, the uh, extent to which um, the clergy going quite high have been putting out statements, both in their churches, but also in the public domain. And I'm just wondering, uh, to what extent do you think they might be able to influence the outcome of the result on the 9th of May? Thank you. So that's a question about the role of the church and the clergy uh, and their uh, ability to influence the result, and we'll take one other question in, uh, here. Yeah, I'm Eric Torrio from the United States. I would just like to ask about um, the Easter Sunday press conference by Disco mm -hmm. Noreg. Uh, I was just wondering of its potential impact on voters' perception, given that it was made during the home stretch of the campaign. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thanks very much. Uh, so that second question for for anyone uh, is to. Uh, ask about the uh, press conference at the Manila Pen on uh, Easter Sunday morning uh, and um, uh, what impact that might have in that uh, uh, press conference for those who aren't aware. Uh, Isco Moreno, the mayor of Manila, called on Lenny Robredo to withdraw from the race. Uh, he's, he's running at about 18% and she at 24%, but uh, he thought that she should uh, withdraw. He said, said those were unscripted comments, but they have gotten a great deal of attention. So uh, uh, let's turn to our panelists, uh, Ronnie Martes or Ona. Um, roll the church and uh, the uh, Easter morning uh, press conference. Quick, quickly on the church maybe the church hierarchy has really lost that much influence over voting behavior the last time we saw this was in when they were campaigning at least in one diocese against those who push for the reproductive health law and the uh, ones who push for it eventually won in the senate place and this is acknowledged by the church hierarchy itself that's why they're doing also the same direct house to house campaigns rather than having one statement they have not excommunicated bombo marcos that's that's the extent that, that you would want coming from the hierarchy, right? Um, on the effect of the Easter Sunday press con, I think it was an attempt towards really saying that there's something wrong with the camp of the vice president, but somehow they have not really replied to it. And in that regard, it may not hurt them as much, uh, but uh, it definitely would not help any of the candidates. The eight percentage point support of might even decline and some 
analysts are saying he has melted down. Um, yes. Um, among the Catholic, in the Catholic hi church hierarchy, I think it's more the lay, laity, the Catholic laity groups. They're the ones who've been endorsing uh, Lenny Robredo. Uh, and, and some of the bishops, but in their own individual capacities. And, and that's right, we don't have any more a cardinal sin like who made a big, had a, played a big role in 86. And Ronnie, you, uh, there is no Catholic vote, right, in the Philippines? The Catholics voted for Duget, Dug, Digong Duterte also. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and and, and on, the, on, the Sunday, on the Easter Sunday press conference, uh, now, uh, the, uh, right after the a day after the press conference, there was news coming from Mindanao. Um, some of the imams, the Muslims who who were initially in favor of uh, Moreno, Mayor Moreno, switched to Robredo. So I think it it really it has hurt him a bit, and also it has not helped the the three studios. Oh, I'm sorry, the three candidates. Uh, oh, no, just to add to what yes, just to add to what Ronnie said as to the presence of Catholic vote, there is actually no Catholic vote in the Philippines because, for example, in the last uh, elections, the twenty nineteen midterm elections, a lot of the clergy endorsed the Otto Derecho slate, and none of the candidates in the Otto Derecho slate won a seat in the Senate. So that's how telling of the absence of the Catholic vote. But there is an influential uh, religious bloc in the Philippines right now. Everyone's waiting for their endorsement, and that's the INT, or Iglesia de Cristo, and they do practice black vote. So we're still waiting for, I think, but I think it's actually telling and obvious who will they endorse for the upcoming May election. So we have that one religious group in the Philippines which, which practices black voting. Yeah, good point. So we, we still are waiting for Iglesia de Cristo to, to uh, come up with their endorsement. Uh, if with everyone's forbearance, there's two more questions uh, that are here. So just to be fair, uh, may I uh, quickly ask uh, uh, these two questions of our moderators, and then I think we'll uh, uh, need to end what has been a fascinating forum. Uh, one question uh, uh, is uh, any new strategic campaigning style that the panelists have noticed in this election that wasn't really used in previous campaigns? Uh, is there a prevalence of scare campaign tactics? Uh, that's the first. And the second, I think I spotted that came from uh, Mike Malley at the Naval Postgraduate School. Hello, Mike. Um, uh, we haven't heard much about campaigns for offices other than president or vice president. Uh, are there any interesting developments in campaigns for, for example, the Senate. So uh, we don't have much time, but if um, there are uh, responses from the from panelists on uh, strategic, strategic campaigns uh, style and uh, scare campaign tactics and uh, any other races that you might want to highlight. Well, I think the one that is more strategic because it has taken quite some time would be the use of micro influencers, the ones that you see in TikTok and YouTube uh, that were mentioned earlier. These are people who are not known. They're not celebrities even, but they've gotten what a number of followers. And to that extent, whatever statements they have, they've got they've also landed into even uh, formal media outfits. So, uh, and I know that we know that one of the candidates has effectively used these micro influencers, micro bloggers, the small ball markets. I think uh, when it comes to messaging, uh, Bong Bong Marcos is effective because he's, he only says one thing to answer all questions. That's unity. Uh, it's a feel good, feel good message. Uh, our reporter already has memorized his entire speech. <laughs> it's the same. Very, very rarely does he go into issues. Maybe when he was in Bataan, he talked a bit about energy, but broadly it's always, you know, unity. So. The people, uh, he makes them feel that the answer to all our problems is unity. So I think that's been an effective messaging, uh, yeah. I guess, because we don't talk about platforms. So 
I don't know yeah. if that's that's been planned way ahead because in 2016, Bongbong Marcos did not campaign on on unity. He he was a bit combative. Also, he responded to attacks against his father. But this time, he has kept quiet on all these issues and just focused. That's very focused on feel good messaging. On, on, on the Senate, just a quick answer. There's nothing really that different. Um, you know, stopping the Senate slate, right? He's uh, one who's a uh, broadcaster vigilante. His own sense of justice, which is a little bit twisted, but he's number one in the senatorial race. Uh, it's just to add to the, to the point that Mr. Just to add to the first, just to answer the first question, I think one interesting phenomenon right now is that a number of groups and all of actually interested groups in observing the election, they're always comparing the crowds during the runs. So a lot of people are, uh, 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 for example, really questioning the number of crowd estimate by this group, vice versa. So that's interesting campaign phenomenon right now, the battle of the crowds for the top contending parties. And just like what Ronnie answered as to the, was something new for the Senate, there's nothing new in the Senate uh, position because most of the uh, names in the surveys uh, conducted by the different polling firms are uh, the same old names. No one, uh, no, there's not a new candidate in the top 12 positions for in the different surveys. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, with apologies to those who have uh, uh, asked some questions uh, that uh, we haven't gotten to, or those on the floor here uh, that we haven't gotten to, uh, I just want to uh, thank our three panelists very much.